Um, I'd like to start first as we embark on this conversation about modifying where we are now, about a roadmap to modifying our stay at home orders, by first taking a look at where we've been, particularly with respect to our planning to date. And as we've discussed, Dr. Galley shared this with you this past week, our focus has really been on making sure that our care delivery system is secure so that it's there if we need it, particularly in a time of surge. As we look at this slide, so across the horizontal here is time, and this is the number of hospitalizations. You'll see that, first of all, we had anticipated through forecasting that with no modifications, with no interventions, indeed our surge capacity would be, go far beyond what we could manage and cause excessive deaths. We have over time, and because of all of you in California, because of people staying home, we've really started to, so to speak, bend the curve. So this line here shows where we would go if we had continued with our current interventions staying at home. And you'll see that not only are we following that line, in fact, with respect to hospitalizations, we're doing even better. But that doesn't mean that we can just let open and send everybody back into the streets and resume life the way we were. Because indeed, if we remove all of our interventions, we again will expect this surge. The opportunity now at this moment is to talk about how we can modify, modify our existing orders in ways that makes it easier for all of us, but also continues to protect the health of Californians. So our goals moving forward, as outlined by the governor, until we build immunity and can know that we're safe from COVID-19 in our communities, our actions will align to achieve the following. <clears throat> First of all, we need to ensure that we have the ability to care for the sick within our hospitals. This is something that we've worked hard for. We're confident that we're moving in that direction now, but we also have to be very thoughtful because as we change interventions, as we make it possible for people to move around more freely, we do know that infections could increase. And indeed, there may be more demands on our hospitals. So it is essential that we ensure our ability to care for the sick as we think and before we move rapidly along changes. Secondly, a very important goal of ours is to prevent infection in people who are at high risk for severe disease. As you know to date, everything that we've done has been to make sure that we can uh, protect those who are most vulnerable from being exposed. That includes um, elderly in, in, in California, helping them stay at home safely, and particularly those who may be in congregate settings, helping to protect those settings and also those who are homeless and incarcerated in other places where we know that should the infection go, we need to be ready to respond. And therefore, as we think about modifying our interventions, we are still razor sharp on this population and making sure that we protect their health. Another goal in our actions as we move forward is to make sure that we build the capacity to protect the health and well-being of the general public in California. I'll go more into details on that before, uh, in just a bit, but as the governor spoke to special ways that we can think about increasing and enhan enhancing the current contact tracing that we do to make sure that we identify people who may be sick or may have been exposed and make sure that we uh, uh, help them, support them in a place where they prevent the infect infection from spreading further. That is another essential area as we think about this work because we know that protects all Californians. And then finally, we need to be clear that the actions that we do move forward in helping to reduce the social, emotional, and economic disruptions that we know many of us are experiencing right now as a result of the stay at home orders. This is because we know particularly that where we are now, while exceedingly important and it's why we are on this curve and why we have the luxury of being thoughtful about modifications, where we are now with the stay-at-home orders, they simply can't be sustained. They're very difficult to sustain in large for a long period of time. We know that they have an impact on the economy. We know that they have an impact on poverty. And we know that they have an impact on our health care. Ultimately, as we think about changing modifications, we need to consider not only the direct impact that COVID-19 has on our health and well-being, but also realizing that as we change modifications, we need to make sure that all of those other areas that impact health, like poverty, like accessing care, all of those other areas are addressed too, so that we improve the overall health and well-being of Californians. So I'm now going to talk with you about the six indicators for modifying a stay-at-home order here in California.
to be very clear, this is not simply about a set of indicators where we check and we move on. This is not about a turn off and a turn off. This is a thoughtful process about how we modify our policies so that ultimately we protect the health of Californians. And I'll share with you now how we're thinking about each one of those indicators, which we'll be assessing over time and which we're working hard to make sure that we have all of the provisions in place that are necessary to make people healthy. So first of all, the first indicator that we're looking at is the ability to monitor and protect our communities through testing, contact tracing, isolating, and supporting those who are positive or exposed. A couple of the key questions we'll be asking ourselves is, for example, how prepared is our state to test everyone who is symptomatic? This doesn't mean that we can't take action before we have entire testings available for everybody across every place in the state, but it's something that is essential for us to understand as we think about what kind of modifications are appropriate. Another example is, do we have the ability to identify contacts of those who are positive to reduce further transmission? Again, this is talking about how we are able to contain the further spread of infection when we identify it in the community as soon as we identify it in the community. And this will be essential and important as we think about creating more opportunities for movement in the community, more opportunities for infection, and uh, unfortunately also more opportunities for potential um, a movement of COVID-19. Number two, the ability to prevent infection in people who are at risk for severe COVID-19. A couple of the key questions we'll be asking ourselves and assessing carefully in our decisions around this include, are older Californians and the medically vulnerable living in their own homes supported so that they can continue appropriate physical distancing? Across the state, we have over 6 million older adults who are either isolating in their home or maybe in congregate setting, and every one of them deserves the support they need to be able to stay safe in their own home. And we're thinking carefully about how we together, working with the state and at counties, have the ability to make sure that we um, uh, assure that these older adults in their homes or who are mo medically at risk are, are kept safe as we move forward and think about modifications. Have we developed a plan to quickly identify and contain outbreaks in facilities, older Californians, those living with disabilities, and those currently incarcerated and, with those, and those with com comorbidities. Specifically, again, this is the congregate settings where we know people are living. We've done a lot to put programs in place that help identify when there are outbreaks, that help provide resources immediately to those settings, and also address some of the very difficult staffing questions. But there is more work to do, and over the coming weeks, we'll be focusing heavily on that to make sure that as we lift again and make it available for people to move, that that doesn't uh, put these populations at greater risk. The ability of the hospital and health systems to handle surges. As I mentioned, as we start to loosen up, there is the possibility for more movement of COVID-19, and we need to make sure that our hospitals are prepared for that. Some of the key questions we'll be asking ourselves include, do we have adequate bed capacity, staff, and supplies, such as ventilators and masks? Over the past few weeks, you've heard again and again all of the hard work we've been doing across the state, both locally, but particularly here at the state, for procuring increased masks and making sure that we have the number of ventilators we need to make sure that if we rely on our care delivery system and if we need those ventilators, they are available to us. We've made great progress. We will continue to watch this, however, because this is a very important area as we think about how we modify our interventions. And can our healthcare system adequately address COVID-19 and other critical healthcare needs? This reminds us once again that while our care delivery system is very well situated at this moment to deal with the amount of cases that we are seeing, it hasn't been necessarily um, con providing the kind of care that we do for regular, uh, our regular health care maintenance over the time because much of that excess capacity has been developed by canceling elective um, surgeries, for example, or putting off or postponing things that aren't so immediate. We need to move back into a space where we can make sure that people's health care needs are regularly met effectively as we think about titrating off some of these interventions. Number four, the ability to develop therapeutics to meet the demand. We feel like this is an important place for California of all states in particular to be engaged in this because there is so much innovation and um, advancements in our medical community here in California. So we have a unique opportunity to collaborate and make sure that these therapeutics 
continue to evolve. They're important, uh, especially in the absence of uh, vaccines, because they allow people, if they do get sick, to recover more quickly and also not to end up in our care delivery system and put more pressure on our care delivery system. This is an opportunity to save lives and for individuals and make it safer for our community at large. So some of the key questions and activities we'll be engaged in include, have we built a coalition of private, public, and academic partners to accelerate the development of therapeutics, and have we identified potential therapeutics that have shown promise. We're already on our path here. We'll continue to do work here and we'll continue to watch it as we assess changes. The ability for businesses, schools, and childcare facilities to support physical distancing. Some of the key questions as we think about enhancing this includes have we worked with businesses to support physical pr distancing practices and introduced guidelines to provide health checks when employees or the general public enter the premises. These are opportunities to think about how are we shaping the physical environment as we go out into those different places, from businesses to our school environment. How have we shaped it so we basically engineered in the opportunity to stay six feet apart? That means we need to spend, we can spend less time trying to avoid bumping into one another, trying to avoid potentially exposing one another to COVID-19, and more time focusing on getting our work done and going about our daily, day, our daily business. And also, do we have supplies and equipment to keep the workforce and customers safe? These will, are areas that we'll continue to explore, particularly as we are more established in the resources that we need for the care delivery environment and to protect our uh, frontline workers. These are opportunities that we have to shift in the future to focus more on these areas to make sure that others can be safe in other places as well and that those resources can be broader as we begin to spend less time in the home. The ability to determine when to reinstitute certain measures, such as the stay-at-home orders, if necessary. This is the last but an incredibly critical uh, indicator for us. Um, and some of the key questions that we'll be talking about are, are we tracking the right data to provide us an early warning system? And do we have the ability to quickly communicate the need to reinstate these measures? We need to have a clear process in place so that we understand not only when we're making great progress, but also when we need to take a step back, think about the interventions we have, modify them, and perhaps even institute broader recommendations once again. This will be an important point to moving forward in a way that's sustainable for California. I just want to end noting that as the governor had mentioned in his opening remarks, this is a conversation about modifying, about modifying, about transitioning from where we are now to a point in the future when COVID-19 no longer poses a threat to our population. That time period, this time period that we're entering, is not about going back to where we were before. It's about going forward in ways that is health, are healthy for all of us. But it won't look the same. Different ways that we will think about the way we do our, our everyday work will mean that we'll be making changes. So for example, restaurants will be likely to reopen, but perhaps they'll have fewer tables, creating greater opportunity for physical distancing between one another when we're eating out, protecting one another as we spend more time in places like we used to enjoy. Face coverings will likely to become common in public. We've talked a lot about face coverings. Some areas are using them and have had much stronger recommendations about using them, but as we spend more time in the public, it becomes even more important that we use all of the different interventions that we have as added value. Face coverings are not a replacement for physical distancing, but they can add protection, and we'll think about that more broadly as more of us go into the public. And then finally, just recognizing that this will bring new opportunities. They'll be likely to arise that will help support our mitigation efforts. This includes things, um, as just discussed by the governor, like creating uh, interventions that can help us improve effectively contact tracing in our communities and supporting individuals who then might need to be separated for some time uh, because they either have infection or they've been exposed. Programs like that will create new opportunities for work and will create new opportunities as we move into this new stage. So with that, I would turn it back over to the governor. Thank you.